Dr. Ford, let me ask you a process question here. Uh, we were going to schedule a break for 12.05. This last break came just a little bit later. I didn't call it at the right time. We're going to have a vote at 12.40. So would it be possible for you to go from now until 12.40 without a break? Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, now it is uh, Senator Cornyn's time. So proceed, Ms. Mitchell. Thank you, Senator. Um, I have a blow up here to my right of the map that was shown to you. Um, the address that's indicated on here as belonging to your family is what all the property tax records showed as being your address. Okay. Just to put it in perspective, I'd like to show you a, a further out, a zoomed out picture so that uh, we can put it in perspective. So we can show the greater Washington area. Of course, you can see the beltway on that, the beltway area. Okay. And uh, then number three, if we could look at that. We, uh, we drew a one mile radius around the country club. And then we calculated from the furthest Mr. Point. Chairman, again, we don't have these documents. No, we're not. That's why she showed three different documents because they depict three different things. So we'd like to see all three documents, please, so we can follow along. She, uh, proceed, please. Okay. Um, looking at uh, number, the third thing here, uh, we calculated the distance from the closest point to your house from a mile radius of the country club um, and then the farthest point. You can see it's, it's 6.2 and, of course, 8.2 miles. Um, and you've described this as being near the country club, wherever this house was. Is that right? I would describe it as be somewhere between my house and the country club in that vicinity that's shown in your picture. Okay. And the country club is about 20, a 20-minute 20 drive from my parents' home. A 20-minute drive. And, of course, I've, I've marked as the crow flies. Yes. Um, would it be fair to say that somebody drove you somewhere either to the party or home from the party. Correct. Okay. Has anyone come forward to say to you, hey, remember, I was the one that drove you home? No. Okay. Um, in your July 6th text to the Washington Post that you looked at earlier, you said that this happened in the mid-80s. Mm -hmm. In your letter to Senator Feinstein, you said it occurred in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. In your polygraph statement, you said it was uh, high school summer in 80s, and you actually had written in, and this is one of the corrections I referred to early, and then you crossed that out. Um, later in your interview with the Washington Post, uh, you were more specific. You believed it occurred in the summer of 1982, and you said the end of your sophomore year. Yes. Um, you said the same thing, I believe, in your prepared statement. How were you able to narrow down the time frame? I can't give the exact date, and um, I would like to be more helpful about the date. And if I knew when Mark Judge worked at the Potomac Safeway, then I would be able to be more helpful in that way. So I'm just using um, memories of when I got my driver's license. I was 15 at the time, and I, I did not drive home from that party or to that party. And once I did have my driver's license, I liked to drive myself. So um, I assume the legal driving age was 16? Yes. Okay. Now, you've uh, talked about attending therapy. Um, in your text to the Washington Post dated 7-6, mm -hmm. so that's the very first statement we have from you, you put in there, quote, have therapy records talking about it. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure I understand that. Did you already have your therapy records at that time? I had looked at them online to see if they existed, yes. Okay, so this was something that was uh, available to you via a computer, like a, a patient portal? Actually, no, it was in the office of a provider. Okay. She helped me go through the record to locate whether I had uh, had record of this conversation that I had remembered. Did you show a full or partial set of those marriage therapy records to the Washington Post? Um, I don't remember. I remember summarizing for her what they said. So I'm not, I'm not quite sure if I actually gave her the record. 
okay? Um, so it's possible that the reporter did not see these notes. Um, I don't know if she's, I can't recall whether she saw them directly or if I just told her what they said. Okay. Um, have you shown them to anyone else besides count, your counsel? Just the counsel. Okay. Uh, would it be fair to say that Brett Cavadon's name is not listed in those notes? His name is not listed in those notes. Would it also be fair to say that the therapist notes that we've been talking about say that there were four boys in the room? Um, it describes the uh, sexual assault and it says uh, erroneously by four boys. So the therapist got the content of it wrong. And you corrected that to the Washington Post reporter, correct? Correct. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Blasey Ford. A lot of people are proud of you today. Um, from a prosecutor's eye view, one of the hardest things that uh, we have to do is to speak to somebody who's come forward with an allegation of sexual assault and let them know that we can't provide the evidence to go forward to trial. It's a hard day for the prosecutor to do that. And so both because making a sincere and thorough investigative effort is such an important consolation to the victim in that circumstance and because it's what you're obliged to do professionally, sincere and thorough investigation is critical to these claims in a prosecutor's world. It may be the most basic thing that we owe a victim or a witness coming forward is to make sure that we give them a full, thorough, and sincere investigation. You have met all of the standards of what I might call preliminary credibility with your uh, initial statement. Um, you have uh, vivid, specific, and detailed recollections, something prosecutors look for. Your uh, recollections are consistent with known facts. Um, you made prior consistent statements, something else uh, prosecutors and lawyers look for. You were willing to and, and did take a lie detector test. And you were willing to testify here, here you are, subject to professional cross-examination by a prosecutor. So you've met any condition uh, any prosecutor could expect to go forward, and yet there has been no sincere or thorough investigation of your claims. You specifically asked for an FBI investigation, did you not? You have to say something. Uh, yes. And are you aware that when the FBI begins investigating, they might find corroborative evidence and they might find exculpatory evidence? I don't know what exculpatory evidence is. It, is. Uh, not helpful to your uh, recollection and, and version of events, helpful to the accused. Understood, yes. So it could go either way. Yes. And you were still not just willing, but insistent that the FBI should investigate your recollection and your claim. Yes, I feel like it would, I could be more helpful in that if that was the case in providing some of the details that maybe people are wanting to know about. And, and as we know, they didn't. And I submit that never, never in the history of background investigations has an investigation not been pursued when new, credible, derogatory information was brought forward about the nominee or the candidate. I don't think this has ever happened in the history of FBI background investigations. Maybe somebody can prove me wrong, but it's wildly unusual and out of character. And uh, in my view, it is a grave disservice to you, and I want to take this moment to apologize to you for that, and to report to anybody who might be listening that when somebody's willing to come forward, even under those circumstances, even having been not given the modicum of courtesy and support of a proper investigation, um, you've shown yourself particularly proud uh, in, in doing that.
and the responsibility for the decision to have this be, I think, the only background investigation in history to be stopped as derogatory information came forward, belongs with 13 men. The President, Director Ray of the FBI, and the 11 members of the majority of this committee. As to the committee's investigation, the fact that uh, Mr. Kavanaugh's alleged accomplice has not been subpoenaed, has not been examined and cross-examined under oath, has not been interviewed by the FBI, tells you all you need to know about how credible this performance is. The very bare minimum that a person who comes forward is owed is sincere and thorough investigation, and you've been denied that, and I will make a personal pledge to you here that however long it takes, in whatever forum I can do it, whenever it's possible, I will do whatever is in my power to make sure that your claims get a full and proper investigation, and not just this. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Since this issue's come up so many times, I'd like to comment. Uh, the New Yorker published an anonymous account of allegations September the 14th. Two days later, Dr. Ford identified herself as the victim in a Post article detailing her allegations. I immediately directed my staff to investigate. September the 17th, Dr. Ford's counsel went on several television shows requesting that her client have an opportunity to tell her story. The same day, I scheduled a hearing for Monday, September the 24th, giving Dr. Ford a week to prepare her testimony and come to Washington, D.C. On September the 17th, committee investigative staff uh, reached out to Dr. Ford and Judge Kavanaugh to schedule follow-up interviews with Republican and Democrat investigators. Judge Kavanaugh accepted the opportunity to speak to the investigators under criminal penalty, uh, Dr. Ford declined. In his interview on September the 17th, Judge Kavanaugh denied the allegations and requested a hearing as soon as possible. Democratic staff refused to participate in that interview. The next day, September the 18th, committee investigative staff contacted Mark Judge requesting an interview. Committee staff also learned the identity of two other alleged party goers and requested interviews. Mark Judge submitted a statement uh, under penalty of felony, uh, denying knowledge of the party described by Dr. Ford, and states that he never saw Brent uh, at the, uh, in the manner described by Dr. Ford. And uh, I can go on and on about that, but uh, we got to realize that what we have done in this case, uh, all the time you go through a background investigation by the FBI, then it comes to us. And there's always some holes in it that we have to follow up on. And besides, Mr. Chairman, we're responding to uh, Dr. Ford's request to tell her s story. That's why we're here. Mr. Ms. Chairman, Mr. Ms. Chairman. Ms. Mitchell, go for uh, Mr. Senator. Chairman, I just want to point out that to support what Senator Whitehouse said, in the Anita Hill case. Can we hear from uh, Dr. Dr. Ford. George Bush ordered that the uh, investigation be opened again. Ms. Mitchell, will you proceed for uh, Dr. for Senator Lee? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Ford, um, the Washington Post reported in their uh, September 16th article that you did show them therapist notes. Is that incorrect? I don't remember physically showing her a note. Okay. Perhaps my counsel did. I don't. I don't remember physically showing her my copy of the note. Okay. But I. I just don't remember. So I'm sorry. I have retrieved a physical copy of those medical records. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, you also attended individual therapy. Uh, did you show any of those notes to? the reporter from the Washington Post. Again, I don't remember if I showed her like something that I summarized or if I just spoke about it um, or if she saw it in my counsel's office. I can't, I, I don't know for sure, but I certainly spoke with her about the 2013 record with the individual therapist. And Brett Kavanaugh's name is not in those notes, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, in reading the Washington Post article, it mentions that this incident that we're here about contributed to anxiety and PTSD problems with which you have struggled. 
the word contributed, does that mean that there are other things that have happened that have also contributed to anxiety and PTSD? I think that's a great question. I think the etiology of anxiety and PTSD is multifactorial. So um, that was certainly a critical risk, risk that uh, we would call it a risk factor in science. So that would be a predictor of the symptoms that I now have. Uh, it doesn't mean that other things that have happened in my life would, have, would make it worse or better. There are other risk factors as well. So have there been other things then that have contributed to the anxiety and PTSD that you suffered? Well, I think there's sort of biological predispositions that everyone in here has for particular disorders. So I can't rule out that I would have some biological predisposition to be what you about know, an anxious type person. What about environmental? Um, environmentally, uh, not that I can think of. Certainly no, nothing as striking as that event. Okay. In your interview with the Washington Post, you said that you told your husband early in your marriage that you had been a victim of, and I quote, physical abuse. In your statement, you said that before you were married, you told him that you had experienced, quote, a sexual assault. Do these two things refer to the same incident? Yes. And at either point on these two times, did you use any names? No. Okay. May I ask Dr. Ford, how did you get to Washington? In an airplane. Okay. It's, I asked that because it's been reported by the press that you would not submit to an interview with the committee because of your fear of flying. Is, is that true? Well, I was willing, I was hoping that they would come to me, but then uh, realized that was an unrealistic request. It would have been a quicker trip for me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So um, that was certainly what I was hoping was to avoid having to get on an airplane, but I eventually was able to uh, get up the gumption with the help of some friends and get on the plane. Okay. When you were here in uh, the mid-Atlantic mid area back in uh, August, uh, end of July, August, how did you get here? Also by airplane. I come here once a year during the summer to visit my family. Okay. I'm sorry, not here. I go to Delaware. Okay. Um, in fact, you fly fairly frequently for your hobbies and your, you've had to fly for your work. Is that true? Correct, unfortunately. Um, you, you were a consulting biostatistician in Sydney, Australia. Is that right? I've never been to Australia, but the company that I worked for is based in Australia, and they have an office in San Francisco, California. Okay. I, I don't think I'll make it to Australia. <laughs> it is long. Um, I also saw on your CV that you list the following interest of surf travel, and you, in parentheses, put Hawaii, Costa Rica, South Pacific Islands, and French Polynesia. Have you been all to those places? Correct. By airplane? Yes. And your interests also include oceanography, uh, Hawaiian and Tahitian culture. Did you travel by air as a part of those interests? Correct. Okay. Thank you very much. Easier for me to travel going that direction when it's a vacation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here, Dr. Ford. Uh, you know, in my old job as a prosecutor, we investigated reports like this. So it gave me a window on the types of cases that hurt women and hurt all of us. And I would always tell the women that came before us that they were going to have to tell their story before a jury box of strangers. And you've had to tell your story before the entire nation. For so many years, people swept cases like yours under the rug. They'd say what happens inside a house didn't belong in the courthouse. Well, the times have changed. So I just want to thank you for coming forward today and for sharing your report with us. Now, I understand that you've taken a polygraph test. Dr. Ford, um, that found that you were being truthful when you described what happened to you. Can you tell us why you decided to take that test? I was 
uh, meeting with attorneys. I was interviewing various attorneys and the attorneys uh, asked if I was willing to take it and I said, absolutely. That said, it was almost as anxiety provoking as an airplane flight. Okay. Um, and you've talked about your recollections um, and seeing Mark Judge at that Safeway. If there had been an appropriate reopening of this background check and FBI interviews, would that help you find the time period if you knew when he worked at that Safeway? I feel like I could be much more helpful if I could be provided with that date through employment records or the IRS or something, Any, anything so that Thank would you. help. I would assume that's true. Dr. Ford, under federal law, and I don't expect you to know this, but statements made to medical professionals are considered to be more reliable. There's a federal rule of evidence about this. Uh, you told your counselor about this back in 2012, is that right? My therapist, mm -hmm. my individual therapist, correct. Right, and I understand that your husband was also present when you spoke about this incident in front of a counselor, and he recalls you using Judge Kavanaugh's name, is that right? Yes, I just have to slow down a minute because I might have been confusing. So there were two separate incidents yes. where it's reflected in my medical record. I talked about it more than those two times, mm -hmm. um, but therapists don't typically write down content as much as they write down process. They usually are tracking your symptoms and not your mm -hmm. story and the facts. I just happen right. to have it in my record twice. So the first time is in 2012 with my husband in couples therapy with the quibbling over the remodel. And then in 2013 with my individual okay. therapy. So if, if uh, someone had actually done an investigation, your husband would have been able to say that you named his name at that time. Correct. Okay. Um, I know you've been concerned with your privacy throughout the process. Um, and you first requested that your account be kept confidential. Can you briefly tell us why? Uh, yes. So as I stated before, once uh, it, I was unsuccessful in getting my information to you before the candidate was chosen, my original intent was to get the information when there was still a list of other candidates available. Uh, and once that was not successful, and I saw that persons were very supportive of the nominee, I tracked it okay. all summer and realized that when I was calculating that risk-benefit ratio that it looked like I was going to just you know, suffer only for no reason. Okay. You know, from my experience um, with memory, I remember distinctly things that happened to me in high school or happened to me in college, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't exactly remember the date. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't exactly remember the time. I sometimes may not even remember the exact place mm -hmm. uh, where it occurred, but I remember the interaction. Mm -hmm. And many people are focused today on what you're not able to remember <laughs> about that night. I actually think you remember a lot. I'm gonna phrase it a little differently. Can you tell us what you don't forget about that night? The stairwell, the living room, the bedroom, the bed on the right side of the room. As you walk into the room, there was a bed to the right. Um, the bathroom in close proximity. <laughs> the laughter, the uproarious laughter. And the multiple attempts to escape and the final ability to do so. Thank you very much, Dr. Ford. Uh, uh, Dr. Ford, I, I want to correct the record, but it's not something that I'm saying that you stated wrongly because you may not know the fact that when, when you said that uh, you didn't think it was possible for us to go to California as a committee or our investigators to go to California to talk to you, uh, we did, in fact, uh, offer that to you, and we had the capability of doing it, and we would have done it anywhere or anytime. So, Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, could I put the polygraph uh, results on the uh, record, please? The polygraph results in the record. Without any but, Is there any objection? Well, well or, let us see the chart. The polygraph? You want to see it? You hold just a minute, I, please. I think you may have it. Uh, can we have the underlying charts, too? The underlying charts? 
I have the polygraph results that I would just like to put in the record. I'll, uh, I'll deal with the charts after that. Could I put the what? polygraph tests in the record? Mr. Chairman, we were, uh, we had proposed uh, having the polygraph examiner testify, as you know. If that had happened, the full panoply of materials that he had supporting his examination would have been provided. You rejected that request, so what we did provide uh, was the polygraph report, which is what the members of the committee currently have. And on September 26, Mr. Chairman, this was actually sent to your chief counsel, and I just want to share it with America so that they have this report as well. Okay, we will accept without objection what you've asked us to include, but we're also requesting and expect uh, the other materials that I've just stated. But Mr. Chairman, you wouldn't allow the underlying witness who performed the polygraph test to testify, nor would you allow Mark Judge to testify. Mm -hmm. And so I would just like to point out, thank you for allowing this report in the record, but that is the reason uh, that we don't have the underlying information for you. You got what you wanted, and I think you'd be satisfied. M Mr. Chairman. I am satisfied with uh, that, thank Senator, you. Uh, go ahead. When was the polygraph administered? It was administered on August 7th, when was it? 2018, when was and it, it was, the date of the report is August 10th, 2018, Mr. Chairman. When was it provided to the hey, committee? Let, let's just see if we can't do this in a more orderly way. Uh, well, it was, I was, he was asking, and I have it right here, and you have it as well. It was We've accepted. September 26th. We've accepted it. All right. Uh, <laughs> Ms. Mitchell for Senator Cruz. Thank you. Dr. Ford, um, we've talked about the day and the night that you've described in the summer of 1982, and thank you for being willing to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's mm -hmm. difficult. Right, but I'd like to shift gears and discuss the last several months. Okay. In your um, statement, you said that on July 6th, you had a, quote, sense of urgency to relay the information to the Senate and the President. Did you contact either the Senate or the President on or before <laughs> July 6th? No, I did not. I did not know how to do that. Okay. Uh, prior to July 6th, had you spoken to any member of Congress? And when I say Congress, I mean the Senate or the House of Representatives or any congressional staff members about your allegations? No. Why did you contact the Washington Post then on July 6th? So I was panicking because I knew the timeline was short for the decision uh, and people were giving me advice on the beach, people who don't know about <laughs> the processes, but they were giving me advice. And many people told me, you need to hire a lawyer. And I didn't do that. I didn't understand why I would need a lawyer. Um, somebody said, call the New York Times, call the Washington Post, put in an anonymous tip, go to your congressperson. And when I weighed those options, I felt like the best option was to try to do the civic route, which is to, uh, go to my congressperson who happens to be Anna Eshoo. Uh, so I called her office and I also put in the anonymous tip to the Washington Post and neither, unfortunately neither got back to me in, before the selection of the nominee. You testified that uh, Congresswoman Eshoo's office contacted you on July 9th, is that right? They contacted me the date that the nominee was announced, so that seems like likely. With had you talked to about your allegations with anyone in her office before the date of July 9th? I told the receptionist on the phone. Okay. On July 10th, you texted the Washington Post again, which was really the third time. Is that right? Second uh, date, third time. Let's see. One moment. Correct. And you texted, been advised to contact senators or New York Times, haven't heard back from Washington Post. Who yeah. advised you to contact senators or the New York Times? Beach friends. Okay. Coming up with ideas of how I could try to get 
to people because people weren't responding to me very quickly. So very quickly they responded to that text for what unknown reason that once I sent that encrypted text, they responded very quickly. Did you contact the New York Times? No. Okay, why not? Uh, I wasn't interested in pursuing the media route particularly, uh, so I felt like one was enough, the Washington Post, and I was nervous about doing that. My preference was to talk with my congressperson. Okay. Uh, the Washington Post te texted back that someone would get in touch, get you in touch with a reporter. Did you subsequently ta talk to a reporter with the Washington Post? Yes, okay. under the uh, encrypted app mm -hmm. and off the record. Okay. Who was that reporter? Emma Brown. Okay. The person who ultimately wrote the story on September 16th? Correct. Okay. Did you talk to any member of Congress, and again, remember, Congress includes the Senate or the House of Representatives, or any congressional staff members about your allegations between July 10th and, the July, th and July 30th, which was the date of your letter to Senator Feinstein? Yes, I met with Congresswoman Eshoo's staff, and I think that's July 18th, um, the Wednesday, and then on the Friday, I met with the Congresswoman herself. Okay. Um, when you met with her, did you meet with her alone, or did someone come with you? I was alone. She had a staff person. Okay. What did you talk about with Congresswoman Eshoo uh, and her staff on July 18th and the 20th? I described the night of the incident, and we spent time speaking about that, and I asked her how to, what my options were in terms of going forward, and how to get that information relayed forward, and also talked to her about fears of whether this was confidential information, um, and she discussed the constituent confidentiality principle. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Grassley. I'd like to ask unanimous consent to submit for the record five articles, including one titled Why Sexual Assault Memories Stick and one entitled Why Didn't Kavanaugh Accuse Her Come Forward Earlier? Police Often Ignore Sexual Assault Allegations. Without objection, so ordered. Dr. Ford, I want to begin by thanking you for coming to testify in front of us today. You came forward with very serious and relevant information about a nominee for a lifetime position on our Supreme Court. You didn't have to. And I know you've done it at great personal cost. This is a public service, and I want you to know that I'm grateful to have the opportunity to hear from you directly today. Uh, I'd like to just first follow up on um, that line of questioning Ms. Mitchell was following, because I think a lot of people don't realize that you chose to come forward with your concerns about Judge Kavanaugh before he was nominated to the Supreme Court. Do I understand correctly that when you, when you first reached out to Congresswoman Eshoo and to the Washington Post tip line, that was when he was on the short list, but before he was nominated to the Supreme Court. Is that correct? Correct. And if I understood your testimony earlier, it's that you were motivated by a sense of civic duty and, and frankly, a hope that some other highly qualified nominee might be picked, not out of a motivation um, at a late stage to have an impact on the final decision. Correct. I felt it was very important to get the information to you, but I didn't know how to do it while there was still a short list of candidates. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, according to Justice Department data, about two-thirds of sexual assault survivors don't report their assaults. Based on your experience, um, I'd be interested in hearing from you about this because you bore this alone. You bore this alone for a very long time. And it'd be helpful for us to better understand the ways that that's impacted your whole life. Well, it's, it's impacted me at different stages of the development of my life. So the immediate impact was uh, probably the worst. So the first four years, I think I described earlier a fairly disastrous first two years of undergraduate studies at University of North Carolina, uh, where I was finally able to pull myself together. And um, then once coping with with 
the immediate impacts, the short-term impacts. I experienced like longer-term impacts of anxiety and relationship challenges. Thank you for sharing that. And, and yet you went on to get a PhD from USC, is that correct? Correct. Um, as you predicted, um, there was a wide range of responses uh, to your coming forward. Um, some um, thousands of survivors have been motivated and inspired by your courage. Others um, have been critical. And as I've reviewed the wide range of reactions, I've been really troubled by the excuse offered by too many um, that this was a high school incident and boys will be boys. To me, that's um, just far too low a standard for the conduct of boys and men in our country. If you would, I'd appreciate your reaction to the excuse that boys will be boys. I can only speak for how it has impacted me greatly for the last 36 years, even though I was 15 years old at the time. And I think, uh, you know, the younger you are when these things happen, it could possibly have worse impact than when you're a full, uh, when your brain is fully developed and you have better coping skills that you've developed. Um, you know, experts have written about how it's common um, for sexual assault survivors to remember some facts about the experience very sharply and very clearly, uh, but not others. And that has to do with the survival mode uh, that we go into in experiencing trauma. Um, is that your experience and is that something you can help the layperson understand? Yes, I was definitely experiencing the fight or flight mode. Is that what you're referring to? Yes, yeah, so I was definitely experiencing the surge of adrenaline and cortisol and norepinephrine and credit that a little bit for my ability to get out of the situation, um, but also some other lucky events that occurred that well, allowed me to get out of the event. Dr. Ford, we are grateful um, that you um, came through it and that you shared your account with us and the American people. And um, I think you've provided um, important information. I'd like to thank you for um, your meeting your civic duty. Um, I wish we could have provided for you a more thorough hearing today. I think asking for the FBI to investigate this matter thoroughly was not asking too much. I think asking to have the other individual involved uh, in uh, your assault, uh, Mark Judge, appear before us today was not asking uh, too much. Uh, I'm grateful you came forward, um, and I'm thankful for your courage, which set an important example. Thank you, Dr. Ford. Ms. Mitchell for Senator Hatt, Sass. Dr. Ford, um, we were talking about you meeting in July with Congresswoman Eshoo. Yes. Uh, did you talk about your allegations with any Republican member of Congress or congressional staff? I did not. Where I live, the uh, Congresswoman is a Democrat. Okay. Um, was it communicated to you by your counsel or someone else that the committee had asked to interview you and that they offered to come out to California to do so? We're going to object, Mr. Chairman, to any uh, call for privileged conversations between counsel and Dr. Ford. Would, would, could, could, we, could you validate the fact that the offer was made without her saying a word? Is it possible for that question to be answered without violating any uh, consul relationships? Can I say something to you? Do you mind if I say something to you directly? Yeah. Um, I just appreciate that you did offer that. I wasn't clear on what the offer was. If you were going to come out to see me, I would have happily hosted you and had you had been happy to speak with you out there. I just did not. It wasn't clear to me that that was the case. Okay. Did does that take care of your question? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, pr proceed then. Before July 30th, the date on your letter to Senator Feinstein, uh, had you retained counsel uh, re with regard to these allegations? No, I didn't think, I didn't understand why I would need lawyers, actually. That's what I just didn't know. A lot of people have that feeling. <laughs> um, Let's talk about the letter uh, that you wrote on July 30th. Um, you asked Senator Feinstein to maintain confidentiality, uh, quote, until... Wait, wait we... until she retrieves it. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to look for it. Which Two one? minutes, I think it's... Yeah. Okay. So stop the clock, will you? It's in there someplace. No. Here it oh, is. I found it. it sorry. Okay. Um, 
you asked Senator Feinstein to maintain confidentiality until we have had further opportunity to speak and then said you were available to speak further vacationing in the mid-Atlantic until August 7th. Is that correct? Oh, the last line, is that what you're, I, I'm, I'm now just catching up with you. Sorry, I'm a little slower. My mind is getting a little tired. So I am available to speak further should you wish to discuss him. Yes, I was in uh, Delaware until August 7th. Okay. And uh, after that, I went to New Hampshire and then back to California. Did you talk with anybody about this letter before you sent it? I talked with um, Anna Eshoo's office. Okay. Um, and why did you talk to Congresswoman Eshoo's office about that letter? Because they were willing to hand deliver it to Senator Feinstein. Okay. Did anyone help you write the letter? No. After you sent your letter, did you or anyone on your behalf speak to Senator Feinstein personally or with any Senate staffer? Yes. Okay. I had a phone call with Senator Feinstein. Okay. And when was that? That was while I was still in Delaware, so before August 7th. Okay. And how many times did you speak with Senator Feinstein? Once. Okay. What did you talk about? Uh, she asked me some questions about the incident, okay. and I answered those questions. Okay. Was that the extent of the gist of the conversation? Yes, it was a fairly brief phone, phone call. Okay. Um, did you ever give Senator Feinstein or anyone else the permission to release that letter? Not that I know of, no. Okay. Between the letter date, July 30th and August the 7th, did you speak with any other person about your allegations? Could you say the dates again? Between the letter date of July 30th and August 7th, so while you were still in Delaware, did you speak with any other person about your allegations? I'm just trying to remember what dates that... Um... Stop the... You're asking her with the exclusion no, the, of any lawyers that she clock. may have spoken with, correct? Correct. Oh, correct. I think correct then. I, I was interviewing lawyers, Start but I was not um, sp okay. speaking personally about it. Aside from lawyers that you were seeking to possibly hire to represent you, did you speak to anybody else about it during that period of time? No. Okay. I was staying with my parents at the time. Did you talk to them about it? Definitely not. Okay. So would it be fair to say that you retained counsel during that time period of July 30th to August 7th? I can't remember the exact date, but it was the, uh, I was interviewing lawyers during that period of time sitting in the car in the driveway and in the Walgreens parking lot in Rehoboth, Delaware, <laughs> and trying to figure out how the whole system works of interviewing lawyers and how to pick one, et cetera, so. You testified earlier that you had, um, you didn't see the need for lawyers and now you're trying to hire them. What made you change your mind? Mm -hmm. It seemed like most of the individuals that uh, I had told, which didn't, the, the total number, the total was not very high, but those persons advised me to, at this point, get a lawyer for advice about whether to push forward or to stay back. Did that include Congresswoman Eshoo and Senator Feinstein? No. Okay. I want to thank Dr. Ford for what you said about uh, acknowledging that we had said we'd come to California. Senator Blumenthal. <clears throat> Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to join in thanking you for being here today and uh, just tell you, I have found your testimony powerful and credible, and I believe you. You're a teacher, correct? Correct. Well, you have given America an amazing teaching moment. And you may have other moments in the classroom, but you have inspired and you have enlightened America. You have inspired and given courage to women. 
to come forward, as they have done to every one of our offices and many other public places. You have inspired and you have enlightened men in America to listen respectfully to women survivors and men who have survived sexual attack. And that is a profound public service, regardless of what happens with this nomination. And so the teachers of America, the people of America, should be really proud of what you have done. Let me tell you why I believe you. Not only because of the prior consistent statements and the polygraph tests and your request for an FBI investigation and your urging that this committee hear from other witnesses who could corroborate or dispute your story. But also, you have been very honest about what you cannot remember. And someone composing a story can make it all come together in a seamless way, but someone who is honest, I speak from my experience as a prosecutor as well, is also candid about what she or he cannot remember. The senators on the other side of the aisle have been silent. This procedure is unprecedented in a confirmation hearing. But I want to quote one of my colleagues, Senator Lindsey Graham, in a book that he wrote in 2015 when he was describing his own service and very distinguished naval service as a trial lawyer. <laughs> I'm not under oath. Uh, he said, quote, of his prosecutions of rape cases. I learned how much unexpected courage from a deep and hidden place it takes for a rape victim or sexually abused child to testify against their assailant. I learned how much courage from a deep and hidden place it takes for a rape victim or sexually abused child to testify against their assailants. If we agree on nothing else today, I hope on a bipartisan basis, we can agree on how much courage it has taken for you to come forward. And I think you have earned America's gratitude. Now, there's been some talk about you're requesting an FBI investigation. And you mentioned a point just a few minutes ago that you could better estimate the time that you ran into Mark Judge if you knew the time that he was working at that supermarket. That's a fact that could be uncovered by an FBI investigation that would help further elucidate your account. Would you like Mark Judge to be interviewed in connection with the background investigation and the serious, credible allegations that you've made? That would be my preference. I'm not sure it's really up to me, but I certainly would feel like I could be more helpful to everyone if I knew the date that he worked at the Safeway so that I could give a, bet, a more specific date of the assault. Well, it's not up to you. It's up to the President of the United States. And his failure to ask for an FBI investigation, in my view, is tantamount to a cover-up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Flake, uh, Ms. Mitchell for Senator Flake. Thank you. Um, in, we've heard this morning uh, several times that you did take a polygraph, and that was on August the 7th. Is that right? I believe so. Is the day I was flying from BWI to Manchester, New Hampshire. Okay. Um, why did you decide to take a polygraph? Um, I didn't see any reason not to do it. 
Were you advised to do that? Again, you're, you're seeming to call for communications between counsel and client. I don't think you mean to do that. If you do, she shouldn't have to answer that. Could, would, counsel, uh, could you let her answer the extent to which she do, do, doesn't violate the, the relationship between you and Dr. Ford? Say what you understood. Based on the advice of the council, I was happy to undergo the polygraph test, although I found it extremely stressful, much longer than I anticipated. I told my whole life story, I felt like, but I endured it, it was fine. I understand they can be that way. Um, have you ever taken any other polygraphs in your life? Never. Okay. Um, you went to see a gentleman by the name of Jeremiah Hannafin uh, to serve as the polygrapher. Did anyone advise you on that choice? Yes, I believe his name was Jerry. Uh, Jerry Hannafin? Yeah. Okay. Did anyone advise you on that choice? I don't understand that. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't choose him myself. He was the uh, person that came to do the polygraph test. Okay. Um, he actually conducted the polygraph not in his office in Virginia, but actually at the hotel next to Baltimore, Washington Airport. Is that right? Correct. Why was that location chosen for the polygraph? I had left my grandmother's funeral at uh, Fort Lincoln Cemetery that day and was uh, on tight schedule to get a plane to Manchester, New Hampshire. So he was willing to come to me, which was appreciated. So he administered a polygraph on the day that you attended your grandmother's funeral? Yeah, correct. Okay. Or it might have been the next day. I spent the night in the hotel, so. I um, remember the exact day. Have you ever had discussions with anyone uh, besides your attorneys on how to take a polygraph? Never. And I don't just mean countermeasures, but I mean just any sort of tips or anything like that. No, I was scared of the test itself, but was comfortable that I could tell the information and the test would reveal whatever it was going to reveal. I didn't expect it to be as long as it was going to be, so it was a little bit stressful. Had you, have you ever given tips or advice to somebody who was looking to take a polygraph test? Never. Okay. Did you pay for the polygraph yourself? I don't, I don't, I don't think so. Okay. Do you know who did pay for the polygraph? Not yet, no. Okay. <coughs> Did you have the handwritten statement um, that you wrote out? Did anyone assist you in writing that statement? No, but you can tell how anxious I was by the terrible handwriting. <laughs> um, did you, we, we touched on it earlier, did you know that the committee has requested the not only the charts from the polygraph test, but also any audio or video recording of the polygraph test? No. Okay. Were you audio and video recorded when you were taking that test? Okay, so I remember being hooked up to a machine, like be, being placed onto my body and uh, being asked a lot of questions and crying a lot. That's my primary memory of that test. I don't know. I know he took a uh, laborious detail into explaining what he was going to be doing, but I 
was just focused on kind of what I was going to say and my fear about that. I wasn't listening to every detail about the, what, whether it was audio or video recorded. Well, you were in a hotel room, right? Correct. Um, regular hotel room with a bed and bathroom? No, no, no. It was a conference room. Okay. So I was sitting at a chair and he was behind me. Did you note any cameras in the room? Uh, well, he had a computer set up, so I guess I assumed that he was somehow taping and recording me. Okay, so you assumed that you were being video and audio recorded? Correct. But you don't know for sure? I don't know for sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to uh, recess now for a half hour for lunch. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ford. We're going to keep going. Yeah. So, 10 minutes after lunch. Yeah, rough. Oh, no.